We're back, Chris. James. Uh, it's James Adair, and we're here with another episode of the Equity Accelerator Podcast. Super yes, happy sir. to be joined by an old friend of ours, Andy Newsom. And today's topic is about um, Andy's a is, is an attorney. He's a family law attorney, so he he is uh, a super important person for when you're managing a, the, a divorce. Uh, yeah. And that's a huge part of life and it's a huge part of um, our, my job as well as a mortgage professional, helping people manage their debts. Um, oftentimes, w- you know, one of the reasons why people call me sometimes for refinance isn't rate related. It's not like, oh, I heard rates are low, let's get a refi. Sometimes, uh, more often than you might think, I get a phone call like, hey, you know what? Um, my wife moved out and I'm going to, I'm going to pay, I need to buy her out of the house because we're heading for a divorce or something, or, or we just got divorced or whatever. So a divorce is a, is a driver for divesting assets. The marital home is a big asset. Um, oftentimes the single biggest asset in a marriage and um, you know, dividing that up properly, fairly, strategically is, is a, uh, is an important part of, owning real estate and, and being prepared uh, in life. So I, I wanted Andy to, to come and help us unpack kind of the key things to consider when you are looking at a divorce or in the middle of a divorce. Um, how does that impact your owning of real estate? And how, you know, if you're about, if you're thinking you, you're going to get divorced, like how do you, another, you know, how do you choose how do you make the decision on who to work with to be, to represent your interests and what are the different ways to go? So a lot of things to unpack and I, and Andy, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's um, it's a pleasure. And I think it's a, a very good idea for people to be able to hear from both sides. Cause the reality is and something as complicated as divorce, people don't just need one professional and they, they typically not always, but they're going to benefit from talking to an attorney. But I think that you know, a lot of people don't understand that, Divorce is also a very good time for you to take a look at your financial planning, your taxes, your your mortgage, and a lot of people that are going to be responsible for taking care of things that historically maybe they haven't had to take care of. That's right. That's a that's a huge thing. Is you know one of the things that we preach here to our clients is making sure you have identified your wealth team, people that are in your corner that sort of know the path your life is on, tax professional, real estate professional, financial advisor, estate planning, these kinds of things where you can just check in every so often and update. Uh, there's so much value in having a professional person kind of help help you understand what to pay attention to and how to prioritize things. Um, and when you're in a divorce, oftentimes, you, you know, a, a, a decision-making unit becomes two decision-making units. And maybe that original decision-making unit, one party was had it, had the financial plan in their mind or, or the relationships, and then the other party just starting from scratch, and they're you know 15, 20 years behind. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, and it's um, you know maybe becoming a bit less less common these days, but it's still very common um, to to see marriages where when it's time to split up really one person has been primarily responsible for the financial planning and the financial decision-making. Um, and that, that makes it harder for the person that uh, is, is you know, looking at their future and doesn't necessarily know what to do. And you know, if that's the person that's going to be keeping the house, you know, ditto, because without a doubt, you know, I tell people much of the time, you may have a fairly straightforward situation with your divorce. You may not need an attorney or you may only need an attorney, you know, for a brief consultation, but people that are dealing with real property that's going to get split up or sold, I, I think you definitely need to be talking to an attorney because that is the area where people can sometimes get themselves into trouble if they don't do it correctly. Right. I mean, I think there's amicable divorces and even amicable divorces, probably there are splitting up of assets that ultimately happen unfairly, whether or not they meant to or not. So it's just understanding the longer term implications of, oh, you take the 401k and I'll take the house or whatever. I don't know. Like sometimes people think at the moment, they're like, oh, that sounds like a great deal. Everyone's happy. But then you fast forward 10 years and one person comes out hundreds of thousands of dollars better than the other. And they didn't necessarily 
mean to or understand that that was the case. Yeah, and 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 real property, you know, you see that uh, probably more than anything else. I mean, I just think that um, you know, a lot of people, the house is an emotional issue, is something that they're attached to, um, yeah. maybe something that they they want to keep because of the children, because they have younger children, school age children, and then they want to maintain stability. You know, always sure. an admirable goal. You, know, you see less people that I think are capable of understanding maybe the investment side of things where it's like, well, I'm also talking about taking a piece of real property, which is sort of a special investment. And, you know, you never know what's going to happen with the market. Um, but, you know, you, you have a pretty good idea that taking the real property is going to be better than taking the depreciating car, um, right. the depreciating boat. You know, most people, if they, even if they don't think of it that way, um, they, they are you know, a vague awareness that, hey, um, getting a house in a divorce is the same thing as buying a house effectively, even though you're only buying half, I guess, from your spouse, soon to be ex-spouse. Mm. But you buy at the right time um, and, and, and the market improves, then you're going to be looking great. Uh, down the road. Whereas mm -hmm. if um, you know, another spouse takes something else and they take money and they spend it or they take the boat and they you know, see it depreciate and they also dump a bunch of money into it, it's going to turn out to not be as good of a financial deal as they thought. Right. So what are the, what are the big, I mean, when people come to me, sometimes I'm the first call, you know, when they say, hey, I'm thinking about getting divorced and they haven't talked to anybody. And I always say, you know, there's, I've seen a lot of different tracks uh, that people can take in a divorce. And I think a lot of people do a lot of late night Google searching on divorces. Um, and there's the kitchen table divorce where you just kind of hash it out with your ex-spouse over the kitchen table and you don't, you know, you can, you download some forms and fill them out and submit them. And I mean, that, that that's like the basic, uh, that's the simplest version, but a lot of times it's more complicated or, or, you know, there's issues that can't be resolved or areas of communication that are dysfunctional to begin with. And, and so bringing in attorneys to, to kind of keep the emotional component managed and also to just to know there's probably, there's probably some simil similar, similar, hit points and milestones in every sort of divorce process that you can usher people through and shepherd people through. Um, what are some, what are some reasons why, to, what are some reasons why going into engaging an attorney um, are beneficial for, for people who are thinking about getting divorced? Oh gosh. Um, you know, what I tell people about this is that it's always beneficial to talk to an attorney earlier on in the process. Don't do a free consultation. You do a free consultation. Those people are, are looking to make money on the back end. You know, that's kind of the way that it works. Not very common in this area anymore that people offer the free consultations, but you know, I don't think it's a good idea. You should find a good attorney with a good reputation, somebody that uh, you can trust based on either your network or, you know, looking at their expertise, their qualities, you know, whatever it may be. Some people, maybe you look at a picture and you think this looks like the type of person I trust. I don't discount that. Um, go to somebody you can trust, pay for their time and an hour of time, two hours of time, you know, maybe all that you need. Um, and if you're, if you're picking the right person, you know, they're going to tell you that. Um, I mean, the situation that you described sort of the kitchen table divorce, you know, I, I love that. Um, and I typically tell people that my cases tend to fall into two buckets. One of them, it's, you know, the, the nastiest, most complicated divorce, you know, for whatever reason, it's got legal complexity, emotional complexity. It's hard. I got to spend a lot of time and effort. I really earn my rate. I have to practice my craft. Um, mm -hmm. The other bucket are the situations that aren't actually that complicated. Um, it, it, they just need a little bit of help, a little bit of advice, you know, somebody to look over their forms, maybe prepare their forms for them, maybe just give somebody a little bit of advice about how they should be negotiating for something a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And those situations, even if they're not, you know, the most intellectually stimulating for me, I enjoy the fact that you try to just be as efficient as possible. Right. Um, and, and save people money. I mean, it's, it's, it's an easy way to turn it into a win for everybody. And a lot of people, a lot of people fall into 
that group. You know, I probably spend the majority of my time on the messy cases because that mm-hmm. needs more time. But in terms of the number of people that are going through this process, there are more people that really are in a position to have a relatively smooth uh, process where they don't have to spend a lot of money on attorneys. And what they need is some good advice early on because later in the game that you bring in the attorney, it's more likely that you're going to make some poor decisions. You know, like mm-hmm. divorce 101 is don't leave the house. Don't move out of the house until you're really sure that you know what's going to happen with the children and the support and the personal property, for example. That doesn't apply to everybody, but it's kind of a, a known rule. Hmm. Um, you know, and a lot of people, they may come in and see an attorney and they've already been separated for some time. And at that point, it's a different reality than it would have been if you're trying to talk about what should be happening earlier on in the game. Similarly, sometimes people start this sort of kitchen table negotiation and they find them that they've made some promises or some assurances and then they go in to talk to an attorney late in the game and, and somebody says, you know, this is really a bad deal for you. Um, but getting back, you know, unwalking those expectations right. uh, can be very difficult with, you know, your soon to be spouse, maybe the mother or the father of your children. So no doubt. You know, I, I tell people, you know, get in, you know, soon. Don't don't be scared. And you know, people don't like to do it. You know, divorce trainings are like dentists. Nobody wants to go see one. Hmm. Um, but you know, if you do it sooner and you get a little bit of advice, you're probably gonna be in a position to save yourself a lot of money and look at a smoother process. Right. Yeah. Go faster. I like what you said about don't make any promises before you've gotten some real advice because if you have to walk it back, I mean, that is, then that can cascade into like taking a lot longer or or renegotiating other things and just setting the expectations early has got to be. You could have taken an amical divorce and made it into a, a gnarly mess if you had to walk it backwards. For sure. Yeah. People don't like to lose something they think that they're going to get. Yeah. Know? Is that why you, why you said don't, ha- don't, like, don't leave the house or move out of the house because it sets a precedent or it sets an expectation that the house is mine then? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, really you've got a whole bunch of issues about the sort of why don't move out of the house. And it almost ends up touching on everything. I mean, on one hand, it's like, well, yes, if it turns out there will be a dispute about who's going to take the house, the person that's been in the house while the other person has been living elsewhere is the best candidate because they're already there. Um, and in some of these situations where there's a lot of conflict and distrust and accusations, you know, moving one person out and the other person back in mm, just doesn't seem like a great idea. It seems like there's a lot more opportunity for, I guess, shenanigans, you could say. Um, I hadn't heard. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I hadn't heard that. Is that's that's good advice. So if you're, I mean if you're thinking you're going to get divorced, if you're already, if you're listening to this and you're already sleeping in the basement, you know, um, stay, stay there until you can kind of get a framework put together. Right. Even if you know you're probably going to leave the house, don't leave the house until you've kind of set some ground rules. Right. And, and, you know, and the children as well. I mean, you, you, you move out of the house and, and then you may find that, you agree to some sort of a schedule that you're going to follow with your children and then you get stuck on it. And then you wow. find out a few months later that it's not better. It's not good for the children you know, in your view. Um, similarly with support, you know, you may find that you leave the house. What happens when one spouse leaves the house, you then got to effectively financially maintain two different households. And if you know, most people don't necessarily think that through completely before they do it. Um, and it may be, you know, very easily result in a situation where one person is you know, sort of slumming it, really getting the short end of the stick in terms of right. the expenses because the house needs to be supported. Um, and you may end up getting then stuck in this situation where the status quo seems like the easiest thing to continue. And we know that it's going to work, even if it's not necessarily fair to you. Hmm. Do both people come and see you, Andy? Like if I'm in living in the basement, I'm like, Hey, listen, we need to go talk to Andy. Do we both come in and see you or should I come see you and my other person should go see somebody else? Yeah, really good question. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's a very common question that I get. Um, I, you know, there aren't a lot of attorneys that do divorce that will sort of see both people. I mean, the reason is that sort of literally ethically, you can't. If you're an attorney, you, you have one client and you owe your obligations to that client. And if you owe them to both clients, you have a conflict of interest. Um, So ethically, you know, you're prevented from doing it. There are some attorneys that um, they sort of do mediation where 
Um, they, they, they brand themselves as mediators. They have agreements that are signed by both parties in advance that basically say, I don't represent either of you. I'm not giving either of you any legal advice. I'm just going to take what you sort of say you want and where you're at. And I'm going to see if I can find some places for you to reach a mutual agreement. And the reason why I think not a lot of people do that is because it's kind of a, a, a malpractice and an ethical violation minefield for the attorney. You know, it's mm. very difficult to walk that line of trying to help people with a settlement without suggesting to one person that what they're about to agree to maybe is really not going to work for them and or their children, right? It, it's, so it's hard. Um, there are a couple of people that, that are in town that do it that I think do a really nice job. And so typically when somebody comes in, I'll usually say, if that's the dynamic that you really want, I'll refer you out to somebody that really does, you know, this mediation. Um, right. But the flip side of that is that you don't, that means that you may not get that advice that you really need, right? right. So sometimes if th that situation, I may say, you know, you, if you're the person that has come in and is, is talking to me, you were referred to me, I may say, well, let's talk for an hour about the strategy and what you should expect and what you should ask for. And then because it's going to be a better dynamic for you and your wife or your husband, then you guys can go off to mediation and meet with somebody. You'll have a bit of education and you know, you're really get in the best of both worlds because yeah. you got some good advice from an attorney. And then even if I'm not you know, sort of there at the time, you're, you may be in a situation where you can bring home the deal in a more of a kitchen table type setting, right? Yeah, I like that. Uh, I like that. Do people, people go into the mediation path? Because that's another thing. I see the kitchen table is sort of like on one end of the spectrum. The next level up is a mediation. And then you've got a uh, divorce with attorneys. And then you've got on the far end of the spectrum, something called collaborative divorce. Uh, which I, I have a little bit of knowledge around, but the mediation people, people tend to choose the mediation um, because they, they perceive it to be affordable. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I don't know who is out there doing the marketing for mediation, but it's I mean, more than collaborative law, at least in, in this state. Um, people like that term, you know, they're attracted to it. Right. And, very often, I think they don't quite understand what it means. They just want it, you know, they, they don't quite <laughs> understand, but they go, I want that mediation. And, and mediation in and of itself, it's a very simple concept. It, it, it can be done in any number of ways. I mean, sometimes the, the example that I referenced earlier was meeting with a single mediator and just the two spouses and nobody else. You know, my line of work, you know, typically if I'm working in a mediation, it's you've got a, a neutral mediator and you've got attorneys on both sides. Um, so I just wrapped up a case where we had, you know, three full days of mediation with uh, two lawyers and a you know, soon to be retired judge acting as the mediator. That was a challenging case that really required, you know, that level of kind of professional work in order to bring home a settlement. And sometimes that is what you need. But uh, mediation is also possible without attorneys present. Um, you could start without attorneys present and stop and say, let's, you know, let's put the kibosh on this. You mm -hmm. can stop and say, let's take a break. And then let's come back with attorneys. Right. And sometimes I do meet with, with both spouses, but you have to be very cautious to explain to the spouse that you, know, you don't, you don't represent that, you know, look, I'm here to try to facilitate this agreement, but I only represent one side and that's all that I can do. And so my understanding is that you guys have, you know, maybe 90% of an agreement and I'm here to say, you know, here's what I'm suggesting to resolve it. But that as well, you know, can be a precarious position for a lawyer to put him or herself in because you may be violating the ethical rules if you're not very, very clear about the fact that you only represent one side. Wow. James, any, any last minute like questions or thoughts on, I mean, you could, we could really keep unpacking this. You, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I think we, we've set the table great. I wanted to kind of wrap in the idea of mortgage financing when you're in a divorce. And usually mm -hmm. there's one party that uh, keeps the house and buys out the other party. You might say, Hey, we bought this house 10 years ago for 200 grand and now it's worth 400 grand. So we've built $200,000 of equity together. I want half of that. Right? So there's lots of ways to calculate. You, you come up with a number, you negotiate with your attorneys, media, whatever you agree to a number. And then the remaining party would look to refinance their current debt in order to pay to cut them the check of that number, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the mortgage guidelines allow for 
a pretty aggressive, you know, way to do it. Oftentimes, if you're doing a cash out refinance, you're pegged to 80% of the value of the house. Uh, in, in this case, it, you bought the house for 200, you know, now it's worth 400. So now you need, you know, 300,000 against a $400,000 house. That's more than, is that more than 80% of the value? Of the house? I don't know. Not, not quite, but the, uh, if you needed more than 80% of the value of your home, if you're buying out a party who's walking away, you can actually finance up to 97% of the value wow. of your house. So you can, your house, oh. it, it I didn't know it's that. not as, and so sometimes people come to me and they are kind of like, I'm going to buy out my spouse before we get divorced. And we, and then we're really capped to oh, right. 80% because we have to call that a cash out refinance. Right. You know, and they're capped at 80% of whatever the house is valued at. I don't know if they get divorced afterwards or not, but it's sort of, they're maybe heading that way. I don't know. And, uh, and then, but if we wait till after the divorce is final, first of all, if you file for divorce or if you file for separation, you can't get a mortgage until you, wow. you, you like take it back. <laughs> We're not doing that anymore. Or you take it to final. It's considered pending litigation. So it really makes uh, the mortgage is, is very, the mortgage underwriting process is very hands off because if you're right. in a position where you're about to take on a, thousand dollars a month of child support cost, you know, we need to make sure we're putting, we're not putting in a position that that could make you not able to make a mortgage payment. So we want, we need to know all of the final details of the new outcome of a divorce. So it has to be either finalized or maybe it won't happen. It hasn't even started yet. That those are the two kind of ends of the, the conversation that a mortgage needs to be on. It can't be in the middle. Uh, so, so if you do it before you file, you can, the buyout has to be basically less than 80% of the, of the value of the home. But once it's been finalized, it takes a lot of pressure off the appraisal. Another thing, another key issue is that if you are, let's say you're remaining in the home and your ex-spouse uh, made a great salary and without that salary, you don't really qualify for the mortgage, right? But you're like, well, but my spouse is going to be giving me $1,500 a month in alimony and child support or whatever. There's this, I'm going to be re replacing part of that income. And with that, I can now qualify. The rules for mortgage, again, once you're divorced, if you don't qualify for the mortgage based on your income and credit at that time, we can't count that alimony child support to pay for the mortgage until we have evidence of six payments. So you have to wait wow. six months after the divorce for that to Wow. To be a to be a usable income. So that's an important idea to know of timing wise. Uh, so oftentimes a, a parent can step in and co-sign in the in the in the gap um, to make that, you know, come off, you know, and just divest yourself from that ex-spouse as soon as possible instead of waiting and right. all that stuff. So there's a lot of ways that I've seen it work, but but those are the those are the key issues that that I see. Those are the key pr the problems that I most see having to solve on the mortgage side in this type of conversation. I feel like you guys both teed it up super, super nice. If anybody is in this type of a situation, um, you both have given a ton to um, chew on and I think opened up an invitation to have a, f a further conversation because, I mean, we've, we've probably only scratched the surface here. Andy, if people wanted to reach out to you and, and connect with you about your work, maybe they, they want to help, uh, they want help from you. Um, in this kind of situation, how do people reach you? What what firm are you at and how do they connect with you? So I'm a partner with Gearing Rackner and McGrath. We're based primarily in downtown Portland. Uh, we also have an Astoria office and we work uh, in Oregon and Southwest Washington. Best way to find information about me is to go to our website, which is www.grmfamilylaw.com. Or you can just uh, Google my name and I'll come up. Perfect, yeah, perfect, thanks. Sweet thanks, Google. And James, you, if people want to connect with you in this kind of a situation, how do people connect with you? Yeah, of course, you can find me on the internet at pdxhomeloan.com. And you can just email me. It's my name, James, at pdxhomeloan.com. I'm the only person there. So just Perfect. find me, uh, Google me there, and you'll find me. Um, and we love your feedback at the Equity Accelerator. So don't hesitate with questions or comments. Um, thank you for joining us, Andy. 
And uh, I know that this conversation is going to be really valuable. It's one of those things that's really, it's hard. I think there's a lot of, uh, it's a hard conversation for people to have with themselves, you know? Yeah. So I think that people, right. there's, a, there's a lot of kind of internal monologuing that goes on yeah. for maybe years before they actually realize that they need to have this conversation. And there's really, that's the best way forward. And, and we see it all the time and we're here to help. And we just want the best outcomes for the people that reach out to us. You know, if you reconcile, that's great. If you need to move forward uh, and divest your real estate in the most efficient, financially efficient, time efficient way possible, that's what we're here for. So okay. again, thanks, Andy. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, James. Thanks, James. Great episode today. Uh, gentlemen, take care. And until next time, see ya. Thanks, Chris.